God, I don't want to die. Who will take my place if I do? Jesus told his followers to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, to every nation, to the ends of the earth. John Chow was a teenager when he took his first missions trip and when he felt called to invest his life to reach the people of North Sentinel Island, who had violently rejected all previous contact with outsiders. John answered that call Here am I. Send me. For the next nine years, every decision John made was with an eye toward going ashore on North Sentinel Island. He served in multiple countries to gain missions and ministry experience. He trained in linguistics to help learn their language. He was certified as an EMT in the hope of serving the tribesmen medically. Once I said yes to Jesus, I was committed. I was all in. I believe that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience. I want my life to reflect obedience to Christ and to live in obedience to Him. I think that Jesus is worth it. He's worth everything. In 2018, with the backing of his missions agency, John went to North Sentinel Island. He knew the risks, but his passion for the North Sentinelese and his desire to be obedient to Christ drove him forward. Sitting in the boat, getting ready to go ashore, John penned a final note and a challenge to his family. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or a God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshiping in their own language as Revelation 7, 9 to 10 states. I pray none of you love anything in this world more than Jesus Christ. Within hours of writing those words, John Chow was killed by the Islanders. John believed that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience, and he would be obedient to God's call, no matter the cost. Who will pay the price to go to every tribe? Once upon a time, a Christian lady named Linda and a Christian man named Patrick got married. It's a true story. Linda was an organizer for Chi Alpha, and Patrick was a graduate from Oral Roberts Evangelical University. And together, uh, they had a boy, a baby boy, and they named him John. Uh, Throughout his childhood, John loved camping, hiking, traveling. Like his father, John would one day go on to graduate Uh, from Oral Roberts Evangelical University. His name was John Chow. As a young adult, John Chow then became a missionary uh, with his sights set on bringing the gospel to the tribal people of North Sentinel Island. This was an unreached people group full of violent savages. And John went, knowing that he would be killed, which he was within hours. And this begs the question, was he in God's will? (laughs) I mean, was he really doing what God wanted him to do? Does God really expect his people, his servants, to go where they know they're going to die? Is that what God wants? 
Verse 21 of our text this morning says that from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. He knew it. So there's your answer. Jesus, to his disciples, has made a plain announcement to them. He has openly declared his intentions of going to an unreached people group full of violent savages where he knows he's going to be killed. Is that really God's will? Was Jesus just too radical? Too zealous? Did he misunderstand God? And go where he knew he would be killed, even though maybe God never really wanted him to go that far. Of course he wasn't mistaken. We know the answer to that. Jesus was in the will of God from beginning to end. And that kind of a life, just so we're aware, isn't unheard of. What we're going to be talking about in the text before us this morning sounds radical, it sounds elite, it sounds like it's just maybe for a few uh, specially chosen and equipped people, uh, but I'm here to tell you uh, before we even begin that this isn't unheard of. Between Jesus Christ's execution and John Chow's execution, there have been an estimated 70 million believers that have died for their faith. It's no secret that obedience is the leading cause of death, or at least one of them, among all of Christ's disciples. Millions and millions have done it. It's not that big of a deal. Jesus isn't just making an announcement in verse 21. He's setting a precedence that has, again, been followed by millions and millions and millions of believers after him. In verse 22, Peter, after Jesus made this announcement, pulled, pulled Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Well, that's just not a good idea. Okay. Uh, you don't want to go rebuking Jesus. You can rest assured that anytime you would read in Scripture of anyone rebuking Jesus, they are in deep sin. He pulls Jesus aside, begins to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. Far be it from you. This shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. Because you're not mindful of the things of God. You're mindful of the things of men. You're preoccupied not with kingdom things. You're preoccupied with earthly things. Get behind me. Why is Peter so opposed to Jesus going to Jerusalem? Think for a moment. A lot of people would say, well, Peter just really loved Jesus. And after two, two and a half years of following him, they've become good friends. And, and Peter was affectionate. His affections for Christ compelled him to defend and protect his friend. Really? Sure, maybe. I, I wouldn't deny that. Maybe, at least on the outside, it seems that that's a, a viable option here. But I would suggest it's something deeper. Why is Peter so opposed to Jesus going to Jerusalem and suffering and dying? I believe it's because if Jesus goes, Peter has to go. And that puts Peter in danger, too. And he knew that for a fact. They all knew that. None of them wanted Jesus to go there. Now, they might not have outright said it, but what Peter did say was enough to reveal what was in his heart. It was enough to reveal what was in his heart, and it wasn't healthy. That's why it was so deserving of the reciprocated rebuke that came from Christ's lips. I don't think that this was as much of a loving attempt to protect Jesus from harm as it was a selfish attempt to preserve himself. It's almost shocking to see right here on the pages of Scripture that anybody 
would have had the gall to rebuke Jesus like that, just openly rebuke him. And yet, how can you be sure that your entire life isn't a rebuke to Jesus? I mean, if you're living a life, you're you're preoccupied with worldly things, you're mindful of the things of men, but ignorant of the things of God, the kingdom isn't first in your life, then what makes you any different than Peter other than that for him, he eventually repented. It came to an end. But for some of us, it's been going on for years and years and years. All the while, we call ourselves Christians, and yet Jesus ain't buying it. You have to understand that when Jesus invites us to follow him, he's inviting us to go with him all the way to the cross. He's saying to his disciples, let's go. I'm going to Jerusalem. If you want to follow me, pick up your cross. He said essentially the same thing to anybody in modern times who wants to follow him. We all want to follow Jesus. Do you know where this is going? Do you know where this path leads? Jesus invites us all to follow him, go with him to the cross. But most people in modern America can't even keep up with him and go to the church. They won't even go to the church. They make excuses all the time. Follow Jesus to the cross? I can't even follow him to church. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I got stuff going on. My family, I got to stay home. My job, I got to stay home. All kinds of excuses after excuses. And I hear them all the time. And I know what it means. It means you're not following Christ. And I'll tell you this, it'll be a long time before the church invests in those who keep making excuses like that. We're called to follow Christ to death. Follow him until it kills you. Well, I can't. Okay then, don't. Jesus identifies that attitude not as sinful, but satanic. He didn't turn around and say, oh, Peter, you got some sin issues to work out. He turns around and goes, you're Satan. It's satanic. When self-preservation is of higher priority than kingdom promotion, you've got problems. And the spirit of Christ is deeply insulted. I, I'm not going to, you know, soft pedal the gospel this morning. We, deep Peter, has deeply offended Christ. He says it himself. You're an offense to me. And there is a lot of us, Jesus isn't around to tell us that audibly, but he would say it if he could. You're preoccupied with the world. You're protecting yourself. You won't follow Christ when it gets difficult. You're satanic. We haven't seen Jesus use language like this. This is new for him. Not even with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, he called them hypocrites, but he never called them Satan, did he? Jesus is deeply offended on God's behalf. He loves his dad. And that's an insult not only to not only to Jesus the Son, but it's also an insult to his father. And Jesus there is offended on God's behalf when after two years of solid teaching and solid training, one of his own disciples is still as flippant as Peter is about service, about serving, about mission. He's insulted that somebody like Peter, after two and a half years of teaching and training, is still so lax in his devotion to Jesus' beloved Father, that he's still yielding himself to worldly interests over heavenly pursuits. He's offended, and yet it happens all the time. It happens all the time, right here in our own midst. Would you believe me if I said to you this morning that some of you are living a satanic lifestyle? I think most of us would deny that. I don't drink goat's blood. I don't sacrifice chickens. I don't have snakes. What are you talking about? I'm not satanic. I worship Jesus. And Jesus would go, really? Because according to my definition, a self-preserving lifestyle, one that puts the things of men above the things of God, that's satanic. 
None of us in here would consider ourselves to be uh, satanic, but if we're self-preserving, Jesus does. Okay? Listen to me. If you're the kind of individual who only serves Jesus up to the point that it gets painful, you only follow him up to the point that it starts to cost you something, but then you stop, that's you. Your life is supposed to be what I would call crucifixive. It's supposed to be self-crucifying. That's what the life of Christianity is meant to be. But if we all just sit around and watch other people do the dying, we read about Peter doing it and Jesus doing it, we watch little videos about John Chow doing it, and some of us, that's all we're doing with our Christianity. We read about it. We champion those who had the bravery to follow Jesus to death, but we won't do it ourselves. When it starts to cost, when it starts to hurt, we bow out. When we get tired, we skip church. When our job interferes, we won't quit our job. Church will suffer. Church will compromise. That's the game America's pl uh, Americans play. And I'll bet you that many of you are doing that. Jesus is not first. And he loved Peter enough to go, you're acting like Satan. Get behind me. And he would say the same thing to one after another of us. If he walked through those doors this morning... I could nearly promise you that because I hear the excuses that you're making. I see the life that you're living and I don't even have half the discernment that Jesus does. He's simply not worth the sacrifice to so many Christians today. Not worth it. Not worth it. You might remember what King David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24. He said, I won't offer to the Lord anything that has cost me nothing. I won't offer anything to the Lord unless it costs me something. David knew better. And that's why some of you might be so dissatisfied right now because if it costs you something, you won't give it to the Lord. Your life is empty. Jesus isn't really being served. He's being given your leftovers. I mean, if you've got spare time, maybe Jesus gets a little bit of that. If you've got a little extra cash, he might get a little bit of that. If Jesus, you know, after we're done exhausting ourselves in worldly pursuits, we'll give Jesus a little bit of what's left over because after all, we're, we're Christian. Jesus doesn't let up on Peter. He, in fact, tightens it down in verse 24. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. <clears throat> if anyone wants to come with me, if anyone wants to come with me, Pick up your cross. If anyone wants to follow me, where? Jesus, where? What are you talking about? If anyone wants to follow you, where? You know what the answer is? To Jerusalem. He's talking to his disciples. First century, real time. He just told them, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. They're going to kill me. You want to come with? You want to come with? I'm going. Peter, you're not going to stop me. I'm going, if any of you wants to come with me, then pick up your cross. So he's telling his, his disciples, it's not just my destiny to die. It's not just God's will that I die. It's God's will that you die too. You're a disciple, are you? We'll see. It's God's will for you to die. So pick up your cross and come with me. They took it literally. They had no choice but to take it literally. Jesus was literally going to Jerusalem to literally suffer, literally die, and he just invited them to come with. They took it literally because that's how it was meant to be taken. You understand that? That's how that statement is meant to be taken. It wasn't hypothetical to them like it is to us. We read that and we're like, oh, yeah. Why? We don't sweat when we read this verse. We don't tremble. They did. They read this and I'll bet you it made them sick to their stomach because they knew what it meant. We read this and we're like, oh, I like that verse. Yeah, pick up your cross. That's my life verse. I have a life verse. It's Matthew 16, 24. I have it written on the inside of my notebook. That's my verse. It wasn't their life verse. This was a death sentence. 
They understood that Jesus meant that they were going to die. When Matthew 16, 24 first came off the lips of Christ, they knew what it meant. They knew that following Jesus was going to kill them. We live in a very skewed culture where Christianity would make you believe that following Jesus would make your life way better. That you will be healthier if you follow Jesus. That you will be wealthier if you follow Jesus. That your life will prosper Doesn't sound like it to me. Not the gospel I'm reading. Sorry. Gets people killed. These guys are going to die. It's terrifying. When you start reading the Bible and you, you actually come to grips with what Jesus is, what it entails, what, what it's going to cost you, it's frightening to realize what Jesus has actually called us into. And if you've never felt that fear, you got it coming. I mean, if you're really going to follow Christ, there's going to come a point where you go, oh man, this is really demanding, actually. Like when Justin jumps around from the pulpit and raises his voice and gets real amped up about stuff, it's, whoa, actually true. <gasps> like who thought that, that this was actually required, that there was expectations, that there were demands to meet and requ requirements to fulfill and I think this catches people by surprise. I see it happen lots. And most people, when they get to that point, they'll follow Jesus up to a point, just like the disciples did. They'll get a couple years in, and then they'll realize what it actually costs. And, and it's at that point that they dismiss themselves from it all and go, well, I think God's calling me to a different church. That's just code for the road is too narrow here. It's too hard. I need a broader path. So I'm leaving this one to find one that's easier for me. That's a lie. That's a lie. Because we offer biblical Christianity here. So when somebody after a couple of years of teaching and training, decides that they don't want this, I know what that means. You're not looking for a different church. You're just looking for a cheaper, easier, safer version of Christianity than the one that's outlined in Scripture. And I'll tell you this, you don't want a different church because there is no different church. This is the church. You were confronted by the church. You came in, and God showed you a real church, and you don't want it. You're leaving because you don't want church. Anyone that you go to out there, you're going to find is requiring the same cross. You have, to, you have to carry the same cross at the next church you go to. They're going to offer you the same road that goes in the same direction. And if they don't do that, they ain't a church. Ephesians chapter 4 says there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Every church offers the same thing. Same God, same Father, same Lord, same baptism, same cross, same road, same grave. Every church offers you a chance to die to self. And if they don't do that, they aren't a church. And if you've left one that offered you that opportunity, you left God's church. You say, I want to follow Christ. <clears throat> a lot of people do that. People did it in the Bible. People do it in this church. I want to follow Christ. Really? We'll find out. As soon as you say that, I want to follow Christ. I want to be a member here. I want to join the team. I want to be on your mission. We will see. We'll see. Because Jesus doesn't force anyone to do it. No one's going to force you to do it. But we will present you with the opportunity to do so. 
The cross that Jesus presents his disciples with in verse 24 is presented as a choice. If you notice, he didn't demand it. He's not commanding them. Jesus turned around and said to his disciples, if you want to follow me, if you want to follow, then you'll need to pick up your cross and you'll need to deny yourself and you'll need to come after me. So I want you to understand that the cross that Christ offers us to carry, and this is important, please hear me, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in the Christian church today. The cross that Jesus is offering is a choice that you must accept. You must willingly take that cross for, for yourself. It's not something that just happens to you. The cross you're to carry as a Christian isn't some circumstance that has, against your will, landed in your life. We volunteer ourselves to this. We choose death. One author says it this way. His name's Josh Black. Don't even know who he is. But this is what he says, and it's very insightful. Quote, a lot of people don't believe a cross is a choice, but something that happens to them, making them a victim. When you hear people say, this is my cross to bear, a lot of times they're talking about their health or their spouse or their children, or some kind of circumstance that's a burden to them. These things may be legitimate challenges to a Christian's life, but they are not crosses. A cross is something that requires us to deny our way of doing things and choose God's way of doing things. Tough circumstances provide plenty of opportunities to pick up a cross, but the circumstance itself is not a cross. It's only an opportunity to choose one, end quote. And we have visitors, and so you all need to understand that this church is a church that will give you the opportunity for you to choose your cross. I can't make you carry it, and I wouldn't even try because Jesus doesn't make his disciples carry it. But we will give you the opportunity to die to self, to do it God's way instead of your way, because I guarantee you that your will, sooner or later, will conflict with God's. And what you do in that situation says everything about where you're at right now and where you're going in the future. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German pastor in the early 1900s, before he was imprisoned and ultimately killed, <clears throat> he wrote, quote, when Christ invites a person to come, he invites them to come and die, end quote. Jesus invites us all to forgiveness and redemption and salvation. And when he does that, he's inviting you to also die. Die. He tells us why in verse 25, because whoever desires to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Who would have thought? I mean, that is backwards, isn't it? But Jesus goes, no, it's actually forwards. This is correct. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it? Now, give it some thought here. What profit is it if a person gains the whole world and goes to hell anyway? Hmm? Or, more personally, what would you give in exchange for your soul? A boyfriend? A girlfriend? A job? Education? A fun weekend? Cars and computers and cell phones and smart stuff? Material things? We know that it would be wrong for us to go, yes, I would exchange my soul for that. We know that that would be wrong, and yet many of us, we will exchange our soul for that. Practically speaking, that's how we, li that's how we live. Jesus isn't first. We're not following him to death. We think he died for us, so I don't have to. No, he died so that you would know how. Your life is supposed to be mirroring his. What this means for you and me 
is that if you're going to follow Jesus, I promise you he's going to lead you into places that make you feel like you're going to die. In places where you actually might die. I don't know. I don't know where Jesus has taken you. But if martyrdom doesn't become a reality, death will at least become a noticeable theme in your life. As you continually give to Jesus what's precious to you before he has to take it from you, you give it up. God, this conflicts with everything that I know I should be doing, so I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to get a different one, which isn't hard these days because people are begging you to come and work for them. $5,000 sign-on bonus. You know, if you sweep floors, we'll pay you 20 an hour. It's like, without excuse. When the Bible says that you will be without excuse, the Bible means that you'll be without excuse. Lord, you want me to walk away from this relationship because I know that it's sinful and I know that it's been sinful and I know that it won't get better, I will. That's what it means to pick up your cross and follow Christ. You giving to Jesus what's precious to you before he has to take it out of your hands. That could be vocationally, relationally, educationally, financial, social. It will be letting go of the precious character that everybody knows you for. The identity that you've spent a lifetime creating for yourself. The reputation you currently have. Death to your self-esteem. Maybe death to your body. But one way or another, obedience to Christ always takes you in the direction of death. Always in the direction of death. Obedience to Christ always goes in that direction. But it's your choice whether you go. You won't stop Jesus from going, and you won't stop his true followers from following him there, but it's your choice as to whether you tag along. You have to make that choice. Not even us here at the church can force you to do these things. You decide. And if you don't want it, I'll leave you alone about it. Because Jesus will. Jesus will let you go on living your life the way that you always have. Lots of people do it. Some of you probably will. Many, many who say that they're Christian will spend their whole life denying Christ in pursuit of earthly gain. And you know what will happen in the end? You will regret it. There's no way around it. You will have deep, perhaps eternal, regrets. If you won't let go of what's precious to you now when Christ is inviting you to do so, you're guaranteed to lose what is most precious to you in the end. And we're talking about eternal souls here. Souls, your own, the souls of others, everything is at stake here, you guys. And once you've made your decision, Jesus will honor the decision you've made. If you withhold your life from him in order to keep it the way you like it, he will honor that decision. And you will go to hell like he promised. He will honor his word. You will lose your soul. He won't revoke just because you're cute. Just because he likes you. The love of Christ doesn't triumph over judgment. He doesn't make exceptions. And he will also honor those who lay down their life to follow him. He says it in verse 27, The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to their works. Either way, he's going to honor his word. Either way, he's going to honor your decision. You can decide this morning that you are not going to follow Christ, that the cost is too high, it's a little too scary, a little too risky, and you're going to go on living life the way that you always have. That's fine, and he's going to honor that decision. Others of you, 
Oh, man. Maybe, maybe after hearing a clumsy sermon like this, the Holy Spirit has chosen to work in your mind and your heart, and you're going, maybe I need to take things seriously. Maybe I do need to lay down what's precious to me. Maybe I do need to take up my cross. Maybe I do need to follow Christ. And you actually do that from this day forward? He will honor that as well. He will honor that decision, and you will not be disappointed. The Bible is saying here that the Son of Man will reward. Jesus will honor those who choose to die for his sake, those who choose to lose their life, those who choose to keep their life will be disgraced and condemned, but those who died by choice will be honored. So what does the Christian life look like? If I may be poetic, I'll describe it to you. The Christian life is for those who choose to be ripped open and have the triplet sins of carnal desire, worldly ambition, and false hope pulled out of them and dashed against the rocks. This is for those whose friends forsook them and fled, just like they did to Christ on the cross. Christianity is for those who choose to allow their own good name to become a byword among those in their former social circle. Those who choose to be stripped of their outer garments of self-righteousness, religion, and reputation. Everything they used to conceal the sinful them. It's for those who bore a crown of shame and guilt that got pounded into their head until it became unforgettable. Christianity is for those who love not their lives even unto death. For those who choose to put self-love on a proverbial cross and kill it like it deserves to be killed. And Jesus Christ wouldn't even think of letting a life like that go unrewarded. If you'll follow him, if you'll obey him, he's going to reward you. Just so that we're clear, <clears throat> I took a veiled shot at the prosperity gospel a moment ago. Health, wealth, and prosperity, if you're unfamiliar with it, you're probably better off. But we do believe in the prosperity gospel here. We very much believe that we will one day be healthy and we will be wealthy and we will be prosperous. We just believe that those who preach it now got the timing wrong. We aren't guaranteed health or wealth or prosperity in this life. Not until we have proven to Christ that we will follow him in spite of the suffering and the shame and the persecution. Most people alive today would think that you're crazy to live for Jesus but 70 million martyrs would say you'd be crazy to not follow Jesus. One of them, a man named Jim Elliott, his name comes up every once in a while, we'd do injustice to not quote him here. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Echoing the words of Christ here, if you lose your life for my sake, then you will see what real life actually is. If you keep your life out of fear or any other reason, you're going to lose it. Why would we hang on to the life that we know isn't satisfying us anyway? And why are we so adverse to the risk that there seems to be in following Christ? We're risk takers, man. We were built to take risks. We just won't do it for Jesus. We're not apprehensive to jump into bed with somebody that we wouldn't dare marry and risk getting a disease from them or bearing a child with them. We wouldn't follow Christ but two steps, but hey, we'll go out to the bar and drive home even though vision's a little blurry and risk our life and the lives of everybody else that we share the road with. I ain't going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to take my entire paycheck, 
paycheck down to Black Bear, throw it all down the drain. Really. And if you really look deeply at your own life, you're going to see that you are very much a risk taker. You know why? Because there's something thrilling in it and there's something rewarding in it and we've perverted it and distorted it and turned it inside out and made it sinful. We're supposed to take risks, but that's supposed to be in the direction of Jesus Christ. So you follow Christ and I don't know what's going to happen. Is he going to kill you? Is he going to send you to North Sentinel Island to go and reach the tribal people that are still unreached to this very day? I don't know. I can't promise that he won't. But I can tell you that he's going to send you to work tomorrow or he's going to send you home this afternoon and give you the opportunity to pick up a cross and deny yourself and do it God's way instead of your way. And I can tell you that if you stick around in this church and you really want to pursue a, a, a deeper relationship with the people in this church and you want to become a member too one day and you want to join classes and you want to be discipled and you want to do anything, I guarantee that there will be opportunities for you to pick up your cross and do it God's way instead of your way. And that will help everybody see where you're at. Peter has a big decision to make this morning, doesn't he? And if Peter doesn't pick up his proverbial cross and follow Jesus to Jerusalem, we know what kind of a man Peter is, don't we? But we've read the rest of the gospel and we know that Peter made the right decision. And we also know that he paid the price. He was crucified too, just like Jesus, except upside down. Like if getting crucified right side up ain't bad enough, <laughs> they all knew where this would go. Because Jesus told them. He was upfront about it. You want to follow me? This is what you can expect. You know how I know? Because I know where I'm going. And I know what I can expect. I'm going to die, Jesus says. He knew the whole time that if he stayed the course and went to Jerusalem that he was going to suffer and die and he even told his disciples. But he went anyway, didn't he? He knew what it would cost. But he laid down his life for several reasons. You want them? First reason? Because his desire was to live for God. Not himself to live for God's joy and God's delight and God's glory. And that meant dying to self, so he did. Second reason, Jesus knew and believed that only by giving up his life would he actually save it. He knew that's how it worked. That's why he's telling us that too. Only by giving up your life will you actually save it. Third reason, he knew God well enough to know that if he died to glorify God, that God would bring him back to life and reciprocate that glory. Jesus knew there was great glory in it for himself, that all he had to do was live for God's glory and that God wouldn't leave him hanging. That promise is made to us as well. And that's the fourth reason why Jesus chose to die, to set an example for us. Jesus didn't die on a cross to save us from dying in that same way. He died on a cross like that to show us how to do it. He wants glory for you too. He wants glory for you too. But if you try to save your life by walking away from what's scary, what's difficult, what's offensive, you walk away and you just check out from the opportunity to follow Jesus to death, all you'll get is shame. And Jesus loves you enough to lead you into death. He wants you to be glorified. And he knows there's only one way to do it. He invites us all to follow him into that same dreadful reality. But it's a beautiful one, you guys. I'll remind you of what John Chow wrote in his journal. Only hours before he was killed, he says, you guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. He says, please don't be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to. That was what John Chow wrote in his journal before he died. Here's what people on Twitter wrote after he died. 
John Chow isn't a martyr, just a dumb American who thought the tribal people needed Jesus. Another one says, John Chow was a deluded idiot. Another one says, John Chow was a criminal. Another one says, the tribal people don't need a God who can't even save his evangelist. And in all the irony of ironies, somebody on Twitter with the moniker Proud Indian says, Jesus saves, failed again. These people are enemies of the cross. And I bet you there's a lot of Christians too that would think that somebody who volunteers themselves to die for Christ would be a deluded idiot as well. You're an enemy of the cross. If you won't volunteer yourself to die for Christ, you are the deluded idiot. You're an enemy of the cross. That's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. He said, they are destined for destruction. Only a deluded idiot would send themselves to hell after knowing what Jesus said here. Even John's father, you remember the Oral Roberts Evangelical University graduate? Even his own dad, in an online article, says that he blamed extreme Christianity for pushing his child to a not unexpected end and, quote, referred with particular bitterness to the Great Commission. Jesus' injunction that Christians spread the gospel to all people. End quote. Upset with his own son for doing what Jesus told him to do. Embittered with his son for following Jesus where Jesus went. Refusing to acknowledge that his son was biblical and that he himself perhaps is not. Nobody in the church has a, a problem with somebody who believes what Jesus said in the text this morning. We all believe it, right? Yeah, pick up the cross, right? People in the church have a problem with people in the church who do what Jesus said in this text. I think what offends most supposed Christians about John Chow's death or anybody else's isn't that some stranger that we've never met got killed for no reason, but that that stranger's death exposes our own unbelief. He actually believed what Jesus said in this passage. Well, do we? He did it. And the only thing that people can do is fire accusations at him. Well, he's a dummy. Stupid American. Uh, no, faithful American, guys. John Chow and 70 million others did what Jesus said in this text. <laughs> Will you? Jesus is asking you now. Do you want to live? Or do you want to die? It's a choice. Pick one. Martyrdom or mediocrity? You pick. Glory or shame? your choice always been your choice Jesus says if you want to follow me then pick up your cross die by choice